All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Tonight, we're going to study another sutra. The sutra that we're going to study tonight, Still, we're still looking at the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're moving on to sutta number 52, the Ataka Nagara Sutta. The uh, the man from Ataka Nagara, the the Nagara, the town of Ataka. So that's where the name of the sutra is coming from. It's the name of the place. Um, before before we get into the sutra, um, yeah, just a kind of a quick note about what what kind of sutra is this tonight? What kind of sutra are we going to look at? Well, tonight, this is one of those suttas where it's not the Buddha. This is one of those suttas, and we've come across these before, where the main person who's going to be doing the talking, well, tonight, it's Ananda. That's right, the Buddha's young cousin. So we want to kind of, as I kind of always um uh, I always want to reinforce this. When you're studying sutras, it's so important to be aware of who is saying what. You always need to be aware in a sutra, is it the Buddha that's saying this? Is it a monk? Which monk? Because they're not all the same in that way. Or it might be a lay person. But it's always important to not just take everything that's coming off of the page as like the word of the Buddha in that way, because a lot of times I've noticed that the sutras include teachings by other people, but not in not because they're good teachings, but actually because they're problematic and you should be aware of that in a way. Now, that's not the case tonight. But we are going to want to be aware tonight that this is Ananda, not the Buddha talking. And I'll mention this now, but I'm sure it'll come up again. Because this isn't the Buddha, this sutra is closer to what we would call the Abhidharma. This, you know, the kind of other category of the teachings of the Buddha, right? We've got the sutras, we've got the vinaya, and then there's the abhidharma. And of course, that word abhi, dharma, well, abhi actually is where we get the kind of the English word about. And so when you're talking about the dharma, that's the Abhidharma, right? Not the Dharma. When you're talking about the Dharma, and what I mean is, is that tonight the sutra is going to get really technical. And of course, the Abhidharma teachings are very technical. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, Buddhism itself, like as a tradition, it, it comes across as very technical. And it is. But actually, often the deep technicalities are not coming from the Buddha. They're usually actually coming from Shariputra, Ananda. And so a kind of, again, the Buddha, if you pay attention, the Buddha teaches pretty simply in that way. Whereas these sutras, like tonight, are going to sound all kind of convoluted with all of these different technical ideas. And I want us to remember oh yeah, this is Ananda talking, not the Buddha. So um, so let's go ahead and start kind of working our way through it. So it begins, thus have I heard, like, of course, all sutras, and of course, the I of thus have I heard is traditionally Ananda, because Ananda's the the one person who supposedly remembered all of the Buddha's teachings, right? And so he's the one who's saying, well, one time I remember 
that the Buddha was uh, living at Baluga or Baluvagamaka near Vaishali. Now, on that occasion, the householder uh, Dasama of Ataka Kanagara had arrived at Patalupita or Pataluputa for some business or another. Because remember, he's a householder. Then Dasama, the householder, went to a certain bhikkhu in Kakuta's park. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he asked, where does the venerable Ananda live now? Venerable sir, I wish to see the venerable Ananda. And that person responded, the venerable Ananda is living in Beluga, Beluvagamaka near Vaishali householder. When the, household, when the householder Dasama had completed his business at Pataliputta, he went to the venerable Ananda at Beluvagamaka near Vaishali. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he asked him this. Venerable Ananda, has one thing been proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, wherein if a bhikkhu abides diligent, ardent, and resolute, is there one thing by which the unliberated mind comes to be liberated? Undestroyed taints come to be destroyed, and one attains the supreme security from bondage that one had not attained before. And just really quickly, Ananda replies, there is, householder, indeed, one such dharma proclaimed by the Blessed One. There is one such dharma proclaimed by the Blessed One. All right, so about this question. So this is going to be interesting for a number of reasons tonight. So this question that the, that the householder, Dasama, has asked, this idea of, is there eka dharma? Is there one thing, one dharma, that can be cultivated or be practiced? Is there one dharma that will make the unliberated mind liberated, make undestroyed taints destroyed, and make one attain su supreme security from bondage? So really quickly, I want to kind of make clear that we're kind of all on the same page because, again, this is going to be very interesting. So somebody like Dasama here, the householder. Oh, and I wanted to remind you that the section of sutras that we're looking at, and this started last week, these are sutras that are two householders. So this is a little group of those. So this is where that fits in. And somebody, a householder, a, a lay devotee like Dasama, he knows that the Buddha has taught a lot of dharma and what i'm what i'm getting at is is i want to kind of remind us of the complexities of this word dharma so what we kind of quickly want to understand is that you know the the buddha taught a bunch of different let's call them truths let's call them principles let's call them laws well let's call them dharmas and these dharmas are, are, are vast in number. There are many, 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 many teachings. If you come to Dharma doors on Sunday nights, we are talking about all of these different dharmas. But Dasama, maybe because he's a householder, who knows? But he wants to know, has the Buddha ever taught just one dharma? that can liberate the mind, destroy the taints, and free one from bondage? 
And Ananda says, yeah, there is one Dharma. So tonight we, we want to, we're going to want to pay very close attention to this one Dharma. Like, what is that one Dharma? Um, before we do that, though, really quickly, I want everybody to be on the same page. So it's about this idea of vimukti, liberation, and the idea of a liberated mind, the idea of taints being destroyed, and the idea of being free from samyojana, being free from fetters or bondage in that way. This sutra, by the way, is going to wind up being about samyojana, what is translated as being fettered or being uh, bound in a way. So we're going to be talking about the fetters. But I do want you kind of all to know, or actually I want everybody to remember, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, we spent a lot of time kind of many months ago dealing with the taints, asava. They're called asava. You might be familiar with the language of outflows. A lot of English translators translate asava as outflows. And then what you're going for in early Buddhism, at least, is reaching a state free of outflows, ana anasava, no asava. Well, really quickly to be these taints are about sensual desire, kama, kama chandra, right? This sensual desire about bahava, existence. Existence is a taint, and we're going to talk about that later. And then avidya, ignorance. Ignorance is a taint. Being confused or ignorant, sensual desire in that way. And this curious idea of existence, these three are the main outflows. But in a liberated one, in one who is liberated, like an arahat, for example, they have no more outflows in that way. So this sutra is sort of dealing with that idea of being tainted with these things, tainted with sensual desire, tainted with existence, and tainted with ignorance. And then these fetters or samyojana. And now Dasama wants to know, is there one thing the Buddha taught that'll get rid of all of that? And the answer is, interestingly, yeah, there is. So what's that one thing, right? Well, here, householder, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, a bhikkhu, a meditator, a practitioner, enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied with applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion. The bhikkhu considers this, this jhana, and understands thus. This first jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally, volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. If one is steady, one, if one is steady in that contemplation, one attains the destruction of the taints. But if one does not attain the destruction of the taints because of that desire for the Dharma, that delight in the Dharma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nirvana without ever returning from that world. 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on in that tiny little paragraph. So we're going to break it down. We're going to go through all of that piece by piece to understand what that one, what, what was the one Dharma, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So it sounded like, of course, if, if, if again, if you've read sutras or you've been coming to Dharma doors, we've heard this before, meaning we've heard quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. That is a stock phrase, stock paragraph. We've heard it over and over and over again. That is the description of the first jhana, right? Or dhyana, if you're into the Sanskrit, right? So what, what's new though? It's that other little contemplation part there. Actually, I'll do, I'm gonna mention this now. I'm gonna mention this now. So let, let the technicalities begin. So if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's footnotes for this sutta, you'll notice that they present this sutra as being an example of what is called Samatha Upananga Vipassana or Pubhangama, Pubhangama. And what that is, is it's insight Vipassana preceded by shamatha, calming. Now, if you don't know this about Buddhism, there are different methods and techniques for the attainment of insight, realization, vipassana. There's different ways to bring that about. And this sutta that Ananda is talking about, or that Ananda is actually teaching, is a sutta about how to achieve vipassana through shamatha first. And that is being described by the, well, first, you got to get into a jhana. Now, let me kind of walk us through that because I want us to be kind of definitely all on the same page. So as we know, of course, there are these four. And actually tonight, we're going to go through 11, or I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but there's 11 stages of meditative absorption in the world of Buddhism, or at least in this sutra tonight, a deep meditative state has these 11 different depths or stages of development. And the very first one is the first jhana. Now, as we know, the first jhana, this first meditative absorption, well, the way that you get into it is, first of all, you got to be quite secluded from sensual pleasures. Now, in the early form of Buddhism, of course, this would basically be sensory deprivation. Going into a, a cave, going into a dark place, quiet, and basically kind of uh, pratyahara in that way, but a withdrawal of the senses, withdrawing the senses from the external world. So quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. So unwholesome states are things like stealing, being violent, killing, lying. And the idea is, is that if you've been running around all day, stealing things and lying to people about it and being violent, you're not really going to be able to just cross your legs and get into a jhana. It, the psychology of Buddhism is about how all of that activity of being duplicitous, being desirous, it clouds the mind. And so you're going to, 
you have to remove yourself from such unwholesome states. So if you've been observing moral precepts and you're quite secluded from sensual pleasures, you could enter upon and abide in this first jhana, which is accompanied by vitarka and vichaya, or applied and sustained thought. Now, in terms of where we're going, we need to remember, oh, right. In the first jhana, there's thinking. There is discursive thought going on. And that discursive thought is either in terms of vitarka, what is called like investigating or looking around, noticing things, and vichara, focused attention. So, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, quite secluded from unwholesome states, one enters into this meditative state in which there is looking around, being aware, and then focusing on various, maybe an emotion that arises, a disturbance, a thought, but noticing the thought, meditating on the thought, so applied and sustained thought. And from the seclusion of this state, there is piti and sukha, rapture and bliss, or rapture and pleasure that are born of seclusion. So that's the first jhana where you are pleased. You are enjoying not sensing. <laughs> You're enjoying the pleasure of solitude, quiet, calm states. And you're getting this rapturous pleasure from that. Now, that's the first jhana. All right. But that's not the one dharma yet. But in that meditative state of the first jhana, the practitioner considers this and understands this. This first jhana that I'm in is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. So that's the one dharma. It is the contemplation of the dependently originated or conditionally originated state of the first jhana. It is understanding that that first jhana, that everything about it is conditioned, conditional. And understanding that, you understand that it is all impermanent and subject to cessation. So let's, di let's dissect that a little bit. Well, let's break all of that down. So first of all, I guess we should define this idea of the, so the, the contemplation is about how this state of the first jhana is conditioned and volitionally produced. So it's basically adi sankra conditioned, adi sankatam, adi sankatam, and adi sanchentyam. Those are the two Pali words. Let's work, let's spend a little bit of time with the first one, the idea of conditioned or conditional. This is language, of course, that comes up a lot in the world of Buddhism. And it's really helpful to be comfortable in this language. I know it's kind of, it can be very philosophical in a way. But I was thinking about it earlier today. And I was thinking, let's let's work with this as, a, as an idea. So if if you're still a little like unclear about the language of conditioned and unconditioned, Samskrita and asamskrita, right? So in, in English, at least, we often talk about the idea of unconditional love, 
Let's talk about unconditional love for a moment. What do we mean when we say that? I love you unconditionally, right? What, what does that mean? Well, one way we can come to an understanding of what that means is by looking at what conditional means. <laughs> so what would it mean for me to say, I love you conditionally? <laughs> well, that would mean that you have to satisfy certain criteria in order for me to, to love you. So have you told the truth today? I'm only going to love you if you've been honest today, right? But if I love you unconditionally, it doesn't matter if you were, have lied or not. My love for you isn't dependent upon anything. So that's another way of putting the idea of unconditional love, right? My love is not dependent upon anything. All right. Ah, there's that language of dependent. And you know, the Buddha is always talking about dependent origination, about everything coming into existence or, or existing, dependent upon something. And this is a way of thinking. It's a way of looking at the world. And it's about looking at the world in terms of dependencies. Now, in the world of Buddhism, these dependencies, well, they can they can come in a lot of different flavors or a lot of different shapes and sizes. And what I mean is, you could look at it in terms of like what I would call physical dependency. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, if I were like, leaning up against a wall, <laughs> I'm literally dependent upon the wall. And if somebody moved the wall, whoop, I, I would fall. So I was, I, at that moment, I was actually physically dependent upon that wall. Or you could look at how the body is dependent upon air, food, and water. Physically, meaning no air, food, and water, you're not going to have a body for very long in that way. So you could look at the world in terms of physical dependencies. And what you would realize is that everything is physically dependent upon something else. But whatever that thing is dependent upon that thing too is dependent upon something and whatever that's dependent upon is dependent upon something else. And it's an infinite chain of dependencies all the way, you know, turtles all the way down as the Chinese like to say, but that's just the physical dimension or level of dependencies. Let's look at a more subtle realm. How about this one? Is, is this up or down? Is this up or down? <laughs> well, it kind of depends. There's that word again, depends. Well, if, or relative to my eyes, I suppose, <laughs> this is up right? This is up. But if I was my upstairs neighbor, or if I was an astronaut, wouldn't, wouldn't right here be down? So right, right here, is this up or down? Oh, it depends. Oh, and then we start to get into those kinds of dependencies which is to say another classic example, am I old or am I young? It's a, it's a simple question. And we immediately realize, oh, my being old or young 
is dependent. It's dependent upon maybe what you think old and young is. It's dependent upon maybe who I'm standing next to, but it's dependent upon something. So those are a few different examples of dependent in that way. Or to go back to the, the language we started with, conditional. It's conditional. Is this up or down? Well, it's conditional. It depends upon the conditions involved. So now that we're kind of thinking in terms of conditionality, we're thinking in terms of dependencies, now we need to understand one other really important thing. And that's the, the thing that Ananda reminded us of. Whatever is conditional is impermanent. That's a dharma. That's a truth. That's a principle and a very important one at that. Whatever is conditional is impermanent. And now if you take your Dharma learning one step further, we know about impermanence in terms of it is a cause of suffering. We don't want things to be impermanent. We want the pleasure to last. We want the object to remain forever. We want the things to be we want them to stay, and they never stay. <laughs> They're impermanent. And if we were comfortable with such impermanence, like totally comfortable with such impermanence, that would be liberation. That would be enlightenment. But the degree to which we get annoyed by change, pissed off by change, saddened by change, saddened by loss, the degree to which we get emotional about impermanence, it reveals the degree of our unenlightenment in that sense. Because things are impermanent. Like, look around. It's the case. So any amount of suffering in that way regarding impermanence is self-imposed. Because you know it's impermanent, but you're holding on to it. I'm holding on to it. We're holding on to it in that way. So that's sort of one interesting thing going on here is recognizing that part of this vipassana, part of this insight is recognizing that the state of the first jhana is conditional and therefore impermanent and therefore still suffering, which is why there's the other 10 meditative states and beyond that we need to talk about. But we still have a we still have a ways to go with this one. I'm gonna pause here. Any questions, comments, ideas? I know it's been a minute since I paused. Anybody got anything so far from where we're at? First Jana stuff. Yeah, no. Um I, th I think I was uh, half expecting you to talk about unconditioned and you haven't yet. Is that coming up or you 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 caught me um not finishing my thought okay <laughs> <laughs> would you like to hear about the unconditioned i would i would like to hear about the unconditioned so the unconditioned of course the asamskrita in the world of early buddhism like the earliest form of buddhism there's only one dharma there's only one thing that is unconditioned nirvana nirvana is is another name for the unconditioned the unconditional so i want to kind of make it clear that in the early form of buddhism there was just there's all the conditional con conditional there's all the conditional things and then there's the unconditioned and you can call it nirvana Eventually, what happens in really technical Buddhism is that akasha, vacuous, empty space, also becomes part of the categories of the unconditioned. But I don't want to confuse anybody with this because I want to you know, I kind of make it clear. So I'm going to use just early Buddhism, like the early version. And the idea here is, is that the unconditioned 
is subtle. <laughs> and I say that because we need to think about, well, I guess since this is technical Buddhism tonight, we need to think about epistemology. We need to think about the idea of like, how do we know things? Like, how do, how do you come to have knowledge? That's epistemology, right? How do you come to know something? And even more interesting, if you know something or you, you, know, you think you know something, how do you know it's true? All of this is, you know, a deep and very interesting philosophy. Well, the idea here is, is that if you think epistemologically about how it is you know things, what you realize is, is that I understand something only in relationship to other things, and therefore the conditional realm, the realm of conditioned objects, which is all of it, that's the realm of understanding because there's things there to be understood. What I'm getting at is, is that the unconditioned is actually really tricky to think about because the very tools that you use to think are part of the conditional. So how do you grok? How do you come to an understanding of the unconditioned? Well, there's a couple of different upaya, a couple of different techniques. And I would basically, for simplicity's sake, put them into two categories, direct experience and analogy. In other words, there are meditative techniques, basically like we're describing, but rather than describing them, you do them and you have an experience of the unconditioned. And you would know it in a sense by its lack of knowable things in a way. It's where we're getting into those very you know, rare meditative states with very little cognition, if no cognition, and so on. So I want to recognize and acknowledge that there is a way of having a direct experience of the unconditioned where you would just kind of know. But then what Buddhism is really good at is working with analogies. And then the way that you work with analogies is through basically this, um, you know, the, the, the classic Buddhist way of talking about it. It's the old finger pointing at the moon idea. And it's about understanding that any analogy for the unconditioned is only gonna be a conditional finger pointing at what is not conditional. And you're gonna miss it if you're looking at the conditional finger and not at the unconditioned, which is being pointed at. Allow me to give you an analogy for the unconditioned. So an analogy that I often like to, to use, or I, actually I've been using it a lot lately, so I'm just gonna keep going with it. I've been using this analogy lately of somebody having a a kind of a panic attack, an anxiety panic attack, where they become convinced that people are coming to get me. And they're coming to get me because of what I did. Now, the thing about this is that there's nobody coming to get me because I actually didn't do anything. But my panic attack is about believing that these people are coming to get me for what I did. And I'm searching for a place to hide. Now, le let me ask you a simple question. What do you think the best place to hide is? <laughs> Well, 
or do you recognize that I don't have to hide? <laughs> but I want you to notice that there's a mind that might be thinking, where, where can I hide? Like, where, where is it where they won't get me? And I want you to notice that thinking that way, meaning thinking about where you can hide, perpetuates the delusion that they're coming. So notice that the actions you're taking in terms of where can I hide are, key, are propelling and keeping them coming, right? Well, let's talk about the nature of them. What I mean is, is uh, uh, what what nationality are they? Oh, they're they don't exist. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, they don't they don't exist. So they don't have a nationality, right? Um, uh, what are they going to use to get me? Are they coming in a van? Are they coming in a helicopter? No, <laughs> they're they're not. What I want you to start noticing about them is that because they aren't, they don't have conditions. They're unconditional because they're not. And that, this is a famous Buddhist Buddha line, by the way. And that which has never come into existence is nirvana. How is it, how is it that that which has never come into existence is nirvana? Well, deep dharma, existing and not existing are conditional. Super subtle dharma there, but Notice, like, notice, for example, my bird friend over there. Is that a real bird? Well, it depends, right? A re real what? What I'm getting at is, is that things existing or not existing is conditional, both of them. So where's the unconditioned? <laughs> it's all pointing in that way. That's, that's my, my point. My point is I'm just using the conditional language, all these examples, but to point at that subtle idea, which is the unconditioned, and nirvana is the unconditioned. Let's go deeper. So how is it that nirvana, how is it that nirvana is this kind of um, goal of Buddhism? Let's put it that way. Like, isn't that kind of what we're going for? Like nirvana? But how could I ever achieve nirvana if it's that which has never come into existence. How could I ever achieve something that has never come into existence? How could that be, right? This isn't making any sense. <laughs> well, let's, let's try to make it make sense. So here's the thing about it. Tonight, you know, we're talking about the the fetters, we're talking about the taints, we're talking about, actually, let's just work with the first taint. It's also a fetter. It's one of the main problems. It's what they're calling sensual desire, kama chanda, this, this uh, needy wantiness of things. It's a problem. That's the idea of Buddhism, is that we're all kind of addicted to sensory sensory stimuli. We need sensory stimuli. And the idea here is, is that in the same way that people who are addicted to other things 
if they don't get their stuff, people who are addicted to things, they get angry when they don't get their stuff, right? They're irritable when they don't have their stuff. Well, from a Buddhist perspective, since we're all addicted to sensory stimuli, when we don't get it, we get bored and then we get irritable and all of these things happen. And so a big part, you know, part of Buddhism is about cultivating a maturity around that and being able to kind of not be so addicted to stuff. So let's work with that one right there. Sensual pleasure or sensual desire. Now, the idea here is, is that from a Buddhist perspective, that craving for the senses, that craving for sensual pleasure is the source of suffering because when we don't have the sensory pleasures, we're, ah, I want my sensual pleasures. Give me my sensual pleasures. We're angry in that way. And then if I get my sensual pleasure, I'm happy for a little while. But then as soon as it's gone, I'm back to being sad. Or if somebody takes it away from me, I'm really mad. So it's all a big mess in that way. So the idea of Buddhism, based upon what I just mentioned, is that it would alleviate suffering for that kama chandra, that sensual desire to diminish. It would alleviate suffering, right? Now... The idea here is, is that you could get into a meditative state where that desire is subsided for a moment, but then you might get out of that meditative state and your desires might reemerge. Well, the idea here is, is that there is a way, there's a technique, there are techniques within the world of Buddhism to completely eradicate addictive greed anger and delusion, the three poisons. And if you were to successfully bring those to cessation, that would be nirvana. So there we are again, we're back at nirvana. But again, nirvana is that which has never come into existence. So does that mean the cessation of the poisons, the cessation of the taints? Does that mean those will never, I don't, I'm confused again. <laughs> and that's because we are missing the, the, the most important piece of the puzzle. What the Buddha seems to have realized, if you ask me, is that all of those psychologies, let's call them, being greedy, being angry, being delusional, all of those psychologies are predicated on the idea of me, the self, thing. And what I mean by that is, is that if you look, interestingly, if you look very carefully at sensual desire, you'll notice that lurking right underneath that is the self that thinks it would be pleased if it acquired that thing. There's a self underneath that thinks if this person would just get away from me, I would be happy. Meaning I'm angry at that person, but that if they would just go away, then I would be happy. So the Buddha seems to have noticed that lurking underneath all of the poisons and all of the taints and all of the fetters, lurking underneath is the idea of me. And then what we do is we do the classic search for me, meaning the self. And I do it every Sunday night. I'm not going to go into it deep here. But again, the basic idea, it's about, ah, I'll give you a new one. I haven't, I haven't used this one before. So usually, of course, in terms of trying to find the self, I start with the body and I talk about, are you your body? 
Meaning when, so when you refer to yourself and you talk about me, is that the same thing as the body? Like, do you mean, and the way that I phrase this is, do, are you the body or do you have a body? But let's do a, di a different one tonight. So you know how, you know how you might have like an internal dialogue, right? Where you're sort of like, you know, talking to yourself, right? If you're talking to yourself, who's listening? How, how many of you are there in there? Now, you, you could kind of go, you know, searching in that way. Or right now, you could recognize that the self is actually just a made up mirage like idea. And there actually isn't such a singularity as me, even though there is the constant reinforcement of such an idea. All I'm getting at, or what I'm trying to get back around to, is in Buddhism, the Atman or the Satkaya, the true body or the Atman or the true self, the idea of the self, in Buddhism, that self of yours, that self of mine, that self, it's just like those people who are coming to get me. It doesn't actually exist, but just like when I'm in my panic attack and I think they're coming to get me and so I'm looking for a place to hide and it makes perfect sense to do that, when there is the understanding of self, there's all kinds of karmic activity that goes into trying to satisfy that self that reproduces and reinforces the delusion of that self, which is no different than when I think they're coming to get me when they're not, but I keep performing all of this karmic activity under the pretense that they are. In Buddhism, the self is the exact same way. In other words, the self has never come into existence. What that means is, and now that we could get a little peek into Mahayana Buddhism, what that means is you're already in nirvana. Because nirvana is that which has never come into existence. The self has never come into existence, so it's already the case that nirvana is the case. Oh, but ignorance, delusion, desire creates that mirage-like illusion of a me, even though if you asked me, I couldn't tell you where I am. I couldn't tell you where I am. Right? So that's where we're at in terms of Nirvana being the unconditioned, being that which has never come into existence, because Nirvana is the realization of no self. There is no self to bring to cessation. There's no self to get rid of. It is already the case. So that's the sort of the good news, so to speak. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about the unconditioned gnome. <laughs> cool. All right, let's get back to the suture then. That was a wild divergence, but that this is what happens with Abhidharma texts in that way. Oh, we didn't even do the, the we've only done one part of this. So, you get into that first jhana through shamatha, probably through anapanasati, mindfulness of breath, into a, a calm state. So that's samatha, right? A calm state into the first jhana. And then you consider this first jhana is conditioned and it's 
volitionally produced. That's the other part of this, the idea of being volitionally produced. So there's a very interesting idea in Buddhism. It gets explored a lot in early Buddhism. It, it kind of fades away in Mahayana for various reasons that I'll mention maybe. But there's this idea of um, sentana or chentana. And chentana is like, it's a tr really tricky word to translate. It gets, it's what is being translated as volition. And there is a sort of way, the best example that I've kind of in my mind, the best example that I've come up with is a, um, a uh, you've, you've played with dominoes as a kid where you stack them up, right? And then you tap the first one and it taps the second one. And then you get this, the domino effect as it's called, right? Well, what I want you to think about in terms of the domino effect, where this domino is hitting that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. Think about each of those dominoes as what the Buddhists call a kashana, a thought moment. So early Buddhism is very interesting psychologically because what it refers to is it refers to thinking and consciousness as taking place in thought moments. These thought moments are, are um, like measurable in terms of being approximately one sixty-fourth of a second. Like they actually give specific time measurements to these things. But the idea is, is that at any given moment, you are in a state of mind, or I actually, I should be careful with my language at this point in the Dharma talk. You're not in anything. There is this mind moment. And the mind moment is sort of a state of mind at any given moment which is then followed by the next mind moment, which is then followed by the next mind moment. And the basic psychology of early Buddhism is that there's a domino effect of thinking that's taking place one domino mind state at a time. But just like dominoes, there's a karmic momentum. There's a karmic momentum to each mind moment that then that is the centana, by the way, the momentum. And then that mind moment, having the momentum that it does, knocks the next mind moment in, into existence, which knocks the next mind moment into existence, which next the next one. And this is the chitta, sen, chitta centana. The I don't even know how to translate chitta centana. They translate it as the the mind stream, the flow of mind states. Now, in early Buddhism, what you can get, literally what you can get into, you can get into the stream of mind thoughts. And what that is, is, is that rather than the delusion of, I'm thinking about this now, I'm thinking about this now. I'm thinking about this now. Rather than there being an agent, rather than there being a sentient subject that's doing the thinking, the delusion of being a sentient subject is part of a state of mind at any given moment. And that delusion of thinking you're a sentient subject has a momentum that you bring into the next mind moment and the next mind moment. And pretty soon, this delusional thinking has a momentum to it all on its own, and it's just life. <laughs> it's the experience of life. Or there's recognizing mind moment by mind moment by mind moment 
and actually understanding all of the dharmas that are going into the manifest manifesting of that state of mind. So you're kind of either along for the ride or you're observing the mind functioning, thought moment by thought moment. What Ananda's saying is that there's a recognition that that first jhana, the state of being in that first jhana is conditional and it's volitionally produced. It's part of the chain of dominoes. And the idea here is, is that the domino chain of mental thought moments, there is a tremendous amount of volition, a tremendous amount of momentum. In some Buddhist traditions, this momentum goes back lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. In other words, it is deeply ingrained. And it's going thought moment by thought moment. And because it has such a samskrita, a conditionality to it, it's kind of like a river current. And we're just sort of like, ah, like along for the ride. But if you're skillful through these meditative techniques, you can move the momentum. You can move that karmic momentum and get the chain of dominoes and get that volition to start moving towards shamatha, towards calming. And then that momentum could be steered into the first jhana. And then in that first jhana, you could have the realization that that jhanic state is conditional and volitional in the way that we've sort of just described. Now there's more to the realization in terms of again, realizing, oh, and whatever's conditional is impermanent and whatever's impermanent is suffering. I don't wanna have anything to do with the first jhana then. And that's when we move to the second jhana. <laughs> so after Ananda, finishes his whole spiel regarding vipassana of or vipassana insight about the first jhana he does it all over again and we're not going to repeat it all tonight but he does it all over again with the second jhana only to come to the same insight realization which is oh wait this second jhana is conditioned. It's volitionally produced. And then the same contemplation afterwards. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, but wait, that's another dharma. And Dasama, our original householder, he asked about, is there one dharma? And in case you missed it, or in case it's not clear, what Ananda is saying is that, yeah, you can get perfectly enlightened through just one dharma. And th that one dharma is this insight about conditionality and volitionality. Is that a word? Volitionality? It is now. So Ananda's saying that if you have this insight regarding the first jhana, yeah, that'll do it. Or... <laughs> You could have this insight regarding the second jhana. Or you could have this insight regarding the third jhana. Or you could have this insight regarding the fourth jhana. You could have this insight regarding the meditation on loving kindness, often called the first immeasurable state of mind, or the first Brahma Vihara. You could have this same realization of conditionality and volitionality, regarding compassion, the meditation on compassion, the second Brahma Vihara, on mudita, empathic joy, the third Brahma Vihara. You could have it on upeksha or equanimity, the fourth Brahma Vihara, and recognizing that that fourth jhanic state 
is also conditioned, also volitionally produced. And then Ananda moves on to the formless samadhis. Infinite space, the meditation on infinite space. Now you would think, but wait, isn't space potentially the unconditioned? Space is unconditioned, but you're meditating on the unconditioned in that way. So the first formless samadhi or the first formless jhana of the meditation on the base of infinite space, still conditioned, still conditional, still volitional. How about the state or the base of infinite consciousness? Still conditioned, still volitional. And then Ananda takes it all the way to the third formless samadhi, the third um, base here, which is the base of nothingness. But that too is still understood as conditional and still understood as volitional. And then basically Ananda says, there you go. I just gave you, oh, it's this beautiful thing at the end, but he says, I, I just gave you 11 different dharmas. Any one of them could be the road to nirvana. And he it says, basically, like, it's just as if somebody built a house with 11 doors. Take your pick. So. All right. Pause for questions, comments, ideas. I know I flew through the end there. So let's, yeah, no, please. So he's going through the first four jhanas, and then he skips, to, and then he goes to the Brahma Viharas, then he goes back to the jhanas. Well, get, yeah. The formless jhanas. What, 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 why the Brahma Viharas are in the middle? Is there a, like a. Oh, no, that's a, that's a pretty classical, um, like the four jhanas, the four formless, or the four immeasurable states of mind and then the samadhis okay so he's so he's using the the brown as, as corresponding with the first four jhanas no it would seem that he that it would seem that this sutra is one of those sutras that puts the four brahma viharas as a kind of adjacent okay. practice it's like yeah i would i would say it's adjacent not the same thing as okay Okay, thank you. And I, no, I either I thought, haven't seen that before or didn't understand it that way. Then. Oh, okay. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, but you might have noticed that there's not the fourth formless jhana. Right. There's not the neither perception nor non-perception. And I I would think so. And if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli's footnotes, they too because that one, the fourth formless jhana, is not conditioned, and it's not volitional. And that's what makes it a kind of a very kind of special meditative state in the world of Buddhism, especially early Buddhism. By the way, if you kind of don't know this about early Buddhism, there's a, because of what I was talking about, actually, I'm actually very glad I presented it all that way. So when I was talking about the domino effect of mind states and that there's like a momentum that has been built up over your, you know, either your personal past or multiple lifetimes, the idea that there's that momentum that is, you know, that basically it's a recognition that the things that we do the things that we say and the things that we think, it's not really free will. <laughs> We're responding all the time, either to our own biology or to external forces, but there's a way in which even what feels like the most free will and agency, if you look deep down, it's conditioned. It's volitional in that way. Because of that, Buddhism, early Buddhism especially, it focuses very heavily on samskara, our conditioned habits, 
because it's our habits that are kind of powering this. And so it's very important, again, in the early Buddhist tradition, it's very important actually to develop a meditative practice to the point of achieving these deeper meditative states, in particular, the fourth formless jhana, the fourth samadhi of neither perception nor non-perception. Because the idea is, is that if you get to that state because it's unconditioned, the mind sort of uh, dips into the waters of the unconditioned. And by doing that, all habitual things are cleared out. It's not that that state of neither perception nor non-perception, it's not that that's the be-all to end-all of existence. The Buddha, like Siddhartha Gautama, the, the, the person who started this tradition in that way, supposedly studied under people who claimed that the state of neither perception nor non-perception was it. Moksha, liberation. If you get there, don't come back. <laughs> like, that's it. In the world of Buddhism, early, early Buddhism, by the way, it's not that that state of the unconditioned in terms of meditative states, it's not that that state is the be all to end all, but the mind kind of needs to go there and have the computer of the mind turned off. And then it gets turned back on with a kind of memory wipe in terms of bad habits. But then the coming back is the coming back to the world, but purified, as the Buddhists would say. The uh, vishuddhi is the language, right? That idea of purified of the fetters in that way. Speaking of which, unless there's any burning questions, I, I blew past a very important part. I'm going back to that first jhana, the, the main section we've been working with tonight. Ananda tells Dasama, oh yeah, there's one thing. Get into the first jhana, then contemplate how the first jhana is dependently originated or conditional. And then obviously remember that everything that's conditional is impermanent. He says, Ananda says, if one is steady in this, so if one is steady in this contemplation, one attains the destruction of the taints. But if one does not attain the destruction of the taints, because of that desire for the Dharma, that delight in the Dharma, then with the destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one due to reappear spontaneously in the pure abodes and there attain final nirvana. So really quickly, Ananda basically says, or what he's basically saying is, if you do what I'm telling you regarding contemplating the first jhana as being conditional, then that will destroy the taints. But if it doesn't destroy the taints... <laughs> then you can basically be assured that you're going to kind of be reborn in one of these pure abodes. And there you'll attain final nirvana. And that is with the destruction of the five lower fetters. <laughs> I want to remind you what I said at the beginning of this, that this sutra seems complicated, but it's because it's an Ananda sutra. Like a, the Buddha, in a way, wouldn't dump this many different ideas on us all at once. There would just be one idea of here. So I want to kind of make that clear. But there are interesting ideas going on in here. So in Buddhism, of course, as you know, they love lists. And so there's a list of Samyojana. 
So there's this word, I've used it a few times tonight, samyojana, um, fetters is the translation. And in Buddhism, old school Buddhism, there's 10 samyojana, there's 10 fetters. The like kind of like really bad ones and the like, they're bad, but they're not that bad. <laughs> Let me explain them really quickly. So the five lower fetters, like the five bad ones that Ananda is talking about eradicating, and then you get to go be reborn in a pure land. You get to be go, uh, reborn in a different place. So those five lower fetters, the first one is the view of a self, the satkaya drishti. So the, the drishti, the view of a true self, it's what I spent a lot of time tonight kind of presenting the Buddhist argument against. So that fetter would be gone if you realized the conditionality of the first jhana. Vichichika or doubt is another fetter that would be gone. A very interesting fetter, a very interesting one of these that we don't, I don't talk much about, but it's a very interesting one. One fetter, a lower fetter that could be removed here, it's belief in the efficacy of rites and rituals, which is a very interesting idea. And the more I, I dug into this one like a while ago, like when I was in grad school. And it would seem that this one in, in our vernacular, like in our language today, it would seem that this one, we would say that it is about um, not being superstitious in that way. Like any kind of superstitious thinking is overcome and that because it's a fetter in that way. And then the last two of these lower fetters that are cut off by somebody who does this is Kamachandra, the desire for sensual pleasure that we've also talked a lot about, and Vyapada, bitterness or anger, ill will. So those are the five lower fetters. So if you were to do the one Dharma that Ananda talked about, and you weren't like entirely successful at it in that way, you could cut off the five lower fetters that we just talked about. And then that would assure that you were what they call a non-returner, an anagaman. You are not going to be a, a gamete anymore. <laughs> You're not going to come back. That's what they're talking about, about reappearing spontaneously in the pure abodes. And there you'll attain nirvana without ever returning to this world again. So again, that's the language of being a non-returner. By the way, if you don't know, this is a part of the early Buddhist tradition where there are these kind of... um. um stages of progress, I suppose you would call them. You can be a stream enterer, a once returner, a non-returner, or an arahat. An arahat has attained nirvana. So the belief or the view in a true self, gone. All of these fetters gone. All of the taints gone. So that's an arahat, an enlightened being, a worthy one. We just talked about a non-returner, somebody who's cuts off the five lower fetters, but not all of the fetters, and therefore has a little more work to do, but not here. Then, of course, there's a once-returner, where you only have one more rebirth, and you will achieve nirvana here in your next rebirth. Or a stream-enterer, where they usually say you have seven more rebirths before nirvana in that way. I just want to mention really quickly that this little interesting non-returner. So the non-returner, again, is the one that is spontaneously born or spontaneously reappears in the pure abodes. 
Now, these are a special set of heavenly realms that are like way, way above other heavenly realms. And this is a special place for very pure people who didn't quite get there where, again, because they are non-returners, but they still have work to do, they go to this pure abodes place. Well, what, you know, it, you kind of have to do a little bit of research to get into this, but you might be aware that there's a whole other form of Buddhism, a kind of um, a sect of Mahayana Buddhism that's called Pure Land Buddhism. And Pure Land Buddhism is basically a type of Buddhism that got really interested in that, meaning the place where the non-returners go. Where are they? I want to go there. <laughs> and so that heavenly abode realm of the non-returner starts to become, well, an, an object of interest. And I just want to use this opportunity in this sutra to point out how this, you might have heard of Pure Land Buddhism. If you go to East Asia, especially if you go to Japan, pretty much all you're going to see is Pure Land Buddhism everywhere. Well, what I like people to know is, is that even though that starts to sound kind of, you know, theistic, Judeo-Christian with ideas of like heaven, I want you to know that it doesn't come from exposure to theistic religions. It doesn't come from exposure to Zoroastrianism or anything like that. No, no. Pure Land Buddhism comes from this interesting little meditation loophole regarding the non-returners and this interesting little place that they go, which isn't back here in sort of samsara, but it's not nirvana. It's not liberated. So just want you to know that this is kind of a reference to it. Any last questions, comments, answers, or ideas about that little part of it? Yeah, Noe. <laughs> yes. Interesting that it all comes together in, in modern, in, in mo yeah, purgatory. Where did purgatory come from? And these ideas and concepts in theism, uh, you know, and, and so it, I, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It has a root. Indeed. <laughs> We're going to cut it off, right? <laughs> nice. Nice. <clears throat> By the way, the five upper fetters. So what, the first one, for example, is Rupa Raga. So Raga is this attraction, wantiness, desire. But it's, what kind of raga? Well, it's rupa raga. Desire for form? No, what they're referring to is the form realm, the realm of pure form. And if you didn't know, the jhanas that we've been talking about tonight, the four jhanas are in the realm of pure form. They're not in the realm of desire. They're in a, a more subtle realm of just form. And there can develop a kind of addiction to meditation. There can be like a, oh, you, you, you hate the world and you really just want to meditate all the time. Well, that's actually called Rupa Raga. And you might even have a attraction, a kind of desire for the formless realms. And that's the second of the higher fetters, Arupa Raga. So in the sutra, when it said that if one doesn't achieve destruction of the taints because of Dharma Raga and Dharma uh, Dharma upanan or not Dharma Ananda. So pleasure in the Dharma and desire for the Dharma, Dharma Raga. 
And so what Buddhism recognizes, you can get too attached to Buddhism. You can get too attached to meditating. You can get too attached to anything, actually. And so, interestingly, what they're saying is, is that if you do this one dharma, this contemplation of the first or any of the jhanas in terms of being conditional or volitional, if you do that and it doesn't cut off the taints, it's because you still have that little bit of desire to be a meditator or to be practicing in that way. So that that probably is as subtle as it gets. <laughs> like that idea of like, even everything I've told you tonight, don't get too attached to that. So I think that would that would be a great note to end the Dharma talk on. <laughs> so <laughs> unless there's any last comments or questions. Awesome. Thank you.